to take the seats. Thank you. Good morning, Excellency President Harima Yaqub of the Republic of Singapore, the whole delegation, welcome to Nazarbayev University. We are gathered here today to hear the lecture of Madam President and we will have a little ceremony afterwards. So actually, without further ado, if I may invite President Halima Yaqub to deliver your lecture. Thank you. His Excellency Sayasat Norbeck, Minister of Science and Higher Education, Her Excellency Zulfia Sulaimanova, Minister of Ecology and Natural Resources, President of Nazarbayev University, Shigeo Katsu, Excellencies, Faculty and Students of Nazarbayev University, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning to everyone. I'm indeed very happy today to visit <clears throat> the Nazanbayev University, a modern research university in the heart of Eurasia. Visiting this esteemed university and meeting its faculty and students is a happy occasion for me, as I also serve as Chancellor of the National University of Singapore, Singapore's oldest university, of which I am also a proud alumnus. Let me first state that I am honoured to receive this honorary professorship from Nazarbayev University. I know that I am following in proud traditions. As I wear this gown, I would like to express my deep appreciation to His Excellency, President Kasim Jomat Tokayev. His Excellency, Prime Minister Ali Khan Smilov, as Chairman of the Board of Trustees of Nazarbayev University and the University's President Shigeo Katsu for the honor. It has made my state visit to Kazakhstan all the more special. I'm also pleased to visit Nazarbayev University, given its close association with the National University of Singapore. Singapore and Kazakhstan both place a high premium on the quality of leaders in the public service. Both aim to train and groom leaders for future roles. The Nazarbayev University's Graduate School of Public Policy has a long-standing partnership with the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy. I am pleased that this partnership has developed over the years. The current Dean of the GSPP is a Singaporean, Professor Hui Weng Tat, who has spent almost eight years in Astana. I think he has probably now become an honorary Kazakh. <laughs> The strong partnership between the GSPP and the LKYSPP is symptomatic of the warm friendship between Singapore and Kazakhstan. 2023 marks the 30th anniversary of our diplomatic ties. To commemorate this milestone, I am happy to be the first Singapore president to make a state visit to Kazakhstan and Central Asia, although this is not my first visit to Astana. Since my last visit in 2017, in my previous capacity as Speaker of the Singapore Parliament, I am amazed to see Astana's space of development, which is now brimming with new buildings and facilities. After my arrival on Sunday, I visited the impressive Astana Grand Mosque, the biggest mosque in Central Asia, and was graciously received by the Grand Mufti. I appreciated the opportunity to go up the minaret I'm sure the Grand Mosque will be visited by many tourists in Astana in the years to come. Singapore-Kazakhstan relations were built on the foundation of strong personal ties between our leaders. Our engagement dates back to Kazakhstan's pre-independence days, when our founding Prime Minister, Mr. Lee Kuan Yew, had first visited Kazakhstan in 1991. 
Over the last three decades, there has been a healthy exchange of visits between both sides. The baton is now passed on to a new generation of leaders to advance the relationship. We are fortunate that President Tokayev is no stranger to Singapore and has many friends there. He had served in Singapore as a diplomat in the 1970s <clears throat> and his first hand experience and has had first hand experience of the Singapore story. I had the pleasure of hosting him in Singapore in 2016 and meeting him again in Astana in 2017. We had very productive discussions yesterday where we reaffirmed the warm and long-standing relations between our countries and discussed ways to expand cooperation in areas such as supply chain resilience, digitalization, and sustainability. I welcome President Tokayev's interest and efforts in fostering stronger exchanges between Central Asia and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN. Our two regions are part of a broader Asia, and we share a common interest in promoting peace and stability, without which economic growth and development cannot take place. It is also in our interest to work, to work towards an open and inclusive regional architecture where all countries, big or small, have equal rights and can settle disputes peacefully. Despite our different national circumstances and developmental needs, there is scope for our countries to share experiences and work together on common challenges. I would like to share my thoughts on three areas which are close to my heart. First, education. From the beginning of our nation-building years, Singapore has invested resources to build up our human capital. In more recent years, we have endeavoured to better customise learning, to cater to students' diverse abilities, and to close learning gaps earlier in life. We are working to create more porosity and diversity in education pathways to give our students more opportunities to pursue education suited to their needs and passions. Singapore values diverse abilities and strives to develop our students holistically. We are freeing up more time and space in schools to focus on developing core values and competencies for the future. We have set up initiatives to rally our community and schools to uplift students from disadvantaged backgrounds to achieve their full potential. We are also strengthening efforts to create more inclusive environments in schools for students with special educational needs. We recognize the importance of lifelong learning and are working towards increasing support for skills upgrading and reskilling for adult learners. I am glad to learn that education is one of the main pillars in Kazakhstan's 2050 strategy. Kazakhstan's National Development Plan 2025 is aimed at improving access to high-quality education through investments in infrastructure and promoting inclusive educational policies throughout Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan also seeks to promote innovation and upgrading of skills, as well as align the needs of aspiring graduates with the ever-evolving requirements of the domestic workforce. In fact, I understand that Nazarbayev University offers their students opportunities for internships and job placements with industry players to apply their skills in real-world settings. These experiences are crucial in building up valuable human capital necessary for the labour market. I welcome and encourage more faculty and student exchanges between Singapore and Kazakhstan, which will not only bring about greater people-to-people -people interactions, but facilitate the sharing of knowledge and best practices. Second, women empowerment. In Singapore, we have made good progress on women's development. Singapore is ranked seventh worldwide for gender equality in the latest UN Human Development Report. Almost half our university graduates are women. Women make up almost 30% of our parliament 
higher than the inter-parliamentary union's average of 26.1%. Nonetheless, more can and needs to be done. Last year, we published the White Paper on Singapore Women's Development after a year-long nationwide engagement. It reflects our shared vision towards a fairer, a more inclusive society, where men and women partner each other as equals, and both can pursue their aspirations freely and fully. Under this partnership approach, men and women support each other in all arenas, including in the workplace and in the family. This is essential, as families are the bedrock of Asian societies like ours. Families impart values that we carry with us through life and shape how we care for others. Families are where equal partnership between men and women is nurtured and promoted. The White Paper sets out action plans by the government and in partnership with the community in areas most salient to women. One key area is on equal opportunities in the workplace. Therefore, the Singapore government is working with the employers and unions to strengthen workplace fairness, including through legislation. We will entrench flexible work arrangements as a workplace norm to enable both men and women to better balance work and caregiving responsibilities. Beyond legislation and policies, a whole of society effort is needed to break gender stereotypes and to shift mindsets. For example, employers can foster family-friendly workplaces and adopt progressive workplace practices to empower men and women to achieve their career aspirations while fulfilling their roles at home. I am glad to learn that Kazakhstan is one of the first Central Asian countries to establish a national entity, the National Commission on Women, Family and Demographic Policy, to promote gender equality, as well as its plans to increase the share of women at decision-making levels in executive, executive, representative and judicial authorities by 2030. Women make up almost half of Kazakhstan's workforce, with a respected 55% of women working in the civil service. Kazakhstan's women are highly educated, passionate and driven individuals, and have been a large contributing factor to Kazakhstan's growth on all fronts. This includes Professor Kunsulu Zakaria, the developer of Kazakhstan's COVID vaccine. I don't know whether Professor Kunzulu is here. I suppose not. Okay. Who was appointed by President Tokayev as the president of the National Academy of Sciences. As a former parliamentarian, I'm also heartened that women make up 18.4% of parliamentarians in Kazakhstan. I welcome Kazakhstan to share its experience in women leadership development as this is an area of interest in Singapore too. Third, interfaith dialogue. My visit to the Astana House of Friendship on Sunday reminds me of Singapore as a multi-ethnic and multi-religious society. Social stability, cohesion, and integration and inclusion of diverse backgrounds within our society are key tenets of our social harmony. There are many religious groups in Singapore and their leaders strongly believe in interfaith dialogues and friendships. For example, the inter-religious organization in Singapore, the oldest interfaith grouping having existed since 1949, regularly holds dialogues to share experiences, perspectives, especially among youth grassroots leaders to support each other in the practice of their faith. At the grassroots level, we also have the racial and religious harmony circles that bring together religious and community leaders, building trust, understanding, and shared experience in each neighborhood. More recently, I also launched the Harmony Champions Program, a collaboration between non-profit organization Roses of Peace and the Masai Foundation to nurture young leaders in Singapore to become champions of interfaith harmony. 
in keeping with Kazakhstan's rich experience in promoting multi-religious and multi-ethnic dialogue, you have established the Influential Congress of Leaders of World and Traditional Religions, which you have regularly hosted for the past 20 years. The seventh iteration of the Congress in 2022 was attended by more than 100 religious leaders from 50 countries, including His Holiness Pope Francis and His Eminence, the Grand Imam of Al-Azhar, Sheikh Ahmad al tayyib I would like to take this opportunity to welcome Kazakhstan to contribute to the International Conference of Cohesive Societies, which Singapore hosted in 2019 and 2022. I had mooted the ICCS, International Conference of Cohesive Societies, to bring together eminent experts and faith leaders to promote interfaith and multicultural dialogue. At a time when many societies are becoming more polarized and divisive, it is even more critical to think about what unites us despite our differences and improve the quality of our conversations, relationships and practice as we build more cohesive societies for the future. I believe Kazakhstan's experience in this important area would be useful to other countries. While Singapore has made progress since our independence in 1965, we certainly do not have all the answers, and there is a need for countries to tailor their policies to suit their own circumstances. Nonetheless, we are humbled and glad to share our experiences with our partners and friends around the world. Under the Singapore Cooperation Program, we have hosted close to 150,000 foreign officials since 1992 in various programs, including in public administration, civil aviation, and finance. I am happy to witness the signing of a MOU yesterday with President Tokayev for Singapore and Kazakhstan to collaborate on a pilot program to provide capacity building programs for Central Asian countries in areas such as public administration, civil aviation, environment, urban development, and trade negotiations. This proposed collaboration between Singapore and Kazakhstan bears testimony to the importance our countries place on our human capital development and to find ways to support the capacity building initiatives of other partners. This is a good example of how our two countries can forge a partnership for the future. Let me conclude by reiterating my appreciation to Nazarbayev University for this honorary professorship and for hosting my visit to the university. This honor is not a personal recognition, but a testimony of the strong bonds of friendship and cooperation between Singapore and Kazakhstan. I am confident that there remains many opportunities for us to explore and work together as we forge ahead and build a brighter and more prosperous future for our people. May the friendship of the Lion City and the land of steps, the great steps, endure for many years to come. Rahmat. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam President. And um, dear all, dear guests, <clears throat> while uh, Madam President Halima Yaqub is uh, in the robing room. Um, we have the pleasure to now uh, watch a movie, a short movie, video about, in particular, uh, the Lee Kuan Yew School and other activities that bind Kazakhstan and Singapore together. And I think some of the themes that she uh, presented, Madam President presented in her speech, in particular, touching upon education, the engendering agenda, and interfaith dialogue, friendship, are all themes that are going to be repeated also partly in the, in the video. So let's enjoy the video, and then we will continue. Thank you.
So we at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy are extremely proud of our strategic partnership with the Nazarbayev University. We've been working together for over eight years. One element of our partnership is what we call the Singapore component. It is actually based on a student exchange. We have students coming from the Nazarbayev University Master Program here in Singapore for close to three weeks. They sit in classes and they learn from our professors but they also have learning experiences across Singapore. We bring them to government agencies, to different hubs in the city, uh, to make sure that they can learn from real world examples. And it's a very enriching experience for them, and we're really proud that we've been doing this for several years. Singapore has uh, a good urban planning, health system, education. We learned a lot about um, internal uh, policy, about uh, how Singapore officials uh, make a planning, performance, accountability. The Singapore component has been running for five years. Although Singapore is very small compared to Kazakhstan, Kazakhstan looks at Singapore as some sort of an example of how Kazakhstan can improve its governance in areas that are relevant for Kazakhstan, so whether it is housing, uh, water, urban planning, uh, industrial development. In the program, I especially like the balance of practical lessons and theoretical lessons. That was very good that we had in class and in field classes. Actually, it was a great opportunity to talk to such professors of the global level who consult other governments on practical issues. Well, this program is actually packed with, with lots of information, lots of knowledge and, of course, experiences given and actually offered by the hand-picked people and of course the whole two and a half weeks program was intensive. Each day uh, gave us a new experience and helped me to look at the things from the different angle. I can say that uh, every day was the best day of my life in this Singapore component so I'm really grateful for giving me uh, this opportunity to be the part of this program. Component is a unique program. I think it's the cornerstone of public policy program JSPP because it helps you to dive in and to explore all the best practices of public policy, especially in the Singaporean reality. There was a good mix of everything and in such a short time we could literally cover the history of Singapore and learning all the know-hows from the experts in the industry and as well as academics from the Likwani School of Public Policy. They talk about reforms as a practical thing. We're not just like uh, academic reading, uh, I'd better say tangible learning. That's something I, I would definitely highlight. Another interesting part of Singapore component uh, were the learning journeys that were followed after the lectures because they allowed to dive in to explore the Singaporean system of public policy in reality. I guess Singapore is a perfect showcase for Kazakhstan to draw lessons from. So we had some fragmentary uh, knowledge about Singaporean public policy in, in the past, but when you come directly to the country and get to know those wonderful experts who were actually the father founders of the Singaporean public policy and that it's amazing to learn all the things and just the puzzles get into one great picture of what the success, what the driving force of the success of Singapore in its sustainable development. So the idea of, uh, of Singapore development is the number of sequence of different reforms which have been quite creative and uh, productive. Singapore in the beginning had nothing and it invested, heavily invested and developed its only capital it had, human capital. So it's surprising, it, Singapore used its comparative advantage and that's why I think Kazakhstan should also follow this example and advance its comparative advantage. Because there are so many takeaways uh, from Singaporean component uh, because of its comprehensive nature. I think it will penetrate to aspects of my work um, and dealing with the public policy maker, policy makers, whether we're talking about the NGOs and ensuring their active engagement into the policy making process and will resonate a lot in my further practice. 
Thanks to Singapore Component, we've learned a lot on the efficient practices from a wide range of sectors. I would like uh, to thank the Graduate School of Public Policy of Nazarbayev University and National University of Singapore, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, Singapore Component, which includes TRIP and uh, sharing experience of how Singapore developed and reached its current uh, state. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, students and faculty of Nazarbayev University. Today we are here to honour Madam Halima Yaakob, President of Singapore since 2017, who is internationally respected for her outstanding contributions to strong governance with a lifelong focus on justice, fairness, gender equity and integrity. These values are consistent with Nazarbayev University's commitment to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. After completing her bachelor's and master's degrees in laws from the National University of Singapore, President Halima was appointed as NTUC Deputy Secretary General. Because of her outstanding leadership, she was soon elected as a member of the Geneva-based International Labour Organization's governing body, allowing international colleagues to benefit from her wisdom and experience. President Halima's deep dedication to the practice of good governance extended to her service in the Singapore Housing and Development Board, the Tripartite Alliance on Fair Employment Practices, the Tripartite Workgroup on Enhancing Employment Choices for Women, and Mendaki Social Enterprise Network Singapore. In her senior government roles, she has served as Minister of State at the Ministry of Social and Family Development and the Ministry of Community Development, Youth and Sports. Appointed in 2013 as Speaker of the Parliament, she upheld and reinforced good governance practices in the Parliament. In the previous year, she had initiated the Diversity Task Force for Women on Boards, now known as the Council for Board Diversity, which has seen a threefold increase of women on boards of Singapore's top 100 listed companies in the last 10 years. She is a tireless advocate for persons with disabilities. In her recent speech, at the Singapore Women's Hall of Fame, President Halima noted a theme that we heard in her speech this morning. She said, we adopt a partnership approach where men and women partner each other as equals, including in the family. President Halima is the first female president of Singapore, and she is a role model for the empowerment of women. She is also Chancellor of the National University of Singapore and Nanyang Technological University, where approximately half the graduates are women. President Halima's distinguished career is a testament to her professional principles of good governance and justice for all citizens. I now invite Nazarbayev University President Shigeo Katsu to confer on President Halima the role of Honorary Professor of Nazarbayev University. <laughs> 